Our great God, we pause before you here this morning to thank you for loving us. Thank you, God, for creating us and giving us life. We, as we just sang, Father, we really do owe everything to you. You have given us life twice over. You created us, and then, Father, you've redeemed us. When we were rebels, when we took great joy and pleasure in everything that was contrary to you, you sought us out, you rescued us, you've claimed us for yourself, you won us, you captured us. You've made us your sons and daughters. God, I pray that we would never, ever for a moment remember who we, forget who we were and that we would always remember who we now are in you. And Father, you've given us more than that. You've given us the high calling to serve you. And these men and these women that are at this institution studying at Spurgeon College and at Midwestern Seminary, Father, the way you're preparing them and what you have in store for them, God, you've called us to be your servants. And so, Father... I pray that as a people devoted to serving you and advancing your kingdom, that we would hear, heed, and embrace the word that you've given to us this day. We love you. We ask you to bless us now by doing those things in our life and in our hearts through the preaching of your word that I cannot do, that none of us can do, that only your spirit can do. Would you meet among us? Would you speak to our hearts? Would you conform us to the image of your son? And Father, would you help us to live for you? In Jesus' name we pray and for his sake. Amen. Well, let me start off this morning with a very simple question. The question is this, what is it that you seek? What is it that you seek in the doing of your stuff? You're here at seminary, you've picked up your home, you've left your families, you've moved across the country perhaps, you've come to this place, you've at least for a moment taken the vow of poverty to be a seminary student. You study hard, you work hard at a job, you give yourself tirelessly to this task. It's a natural question to ask and wonder about what is it that you seek in the doing of all of this stuff? I ask that question and immediately there's an obvious answer. You seek to honor Christ. You seek to walk with Christ. You seek to build his kingdom. And I grant that that is probably the case for the vast majority of us in this room, but I still press the question, what is it that you seek? I press that question because our enemy is cunning, he's crafty, and he's oh so subtle. He has the ability to take those things which are pure and corrupt them. He has those abilities to take that which is solid and to make it soft and mushy. He has the ability to take something good and twist it and pervert it in ways that advance his kingdom, not Christ's kingdom. And if we're not careful in the process of all of this doing, all of a sudden our hearts can begin to morph and to change into things that were not originally there. It may have started off as something very pure and very good and very noble and very sincere in devotion to Christ, but if we're not careful, it can become something else. You say, surely not. No, listen, I've been in some kind of theological education as a student, as a professor, as an administrator, or now a president now for 24 some years. I've watched thousands of students come through institutions like this, and here's what I can tell you can happen to us during this time if we're not careful. And this isn't a problem just unique to Midwestern or Southeastern or New Orleans or Southern or Toccoa Falls where I came from. This is just a dynamic of a place like this. We come to a place like this, and what got us here in the first place is our, our faith, our walk with God, starts off as something very simple and very sincere. It starts off as a very spiritual thing and a very personal thing, but if we're not careful, during this time, it can become a very academic thing. And in this place, we morph. We once were here as a purely devotional act, and now it becomes the type of thing where we've become professionals or intellectuals first. Our faith morphs from being first and foremost spiritual and personal and to now being predominantly professional or intellectual. And if we're not careful, we end up going about the business and the doing of all of this stuff for all of the wrong reasons. What started off as pure and good and noble now has taken a turn and morphed into something else. 
And so I pressed the question for us this morning, what is it that you seek? Because it's during this time, a seminary of all places. You come here and you think that maybe your walk with God is going to explode and thrive and you're going to dig deep in God's word and you're going to be closer to God than you've ever been. But because it becomes a predominantly professional thing, if you're not careful, all of a sudden your walk with God just begins to shrivel up. And the next thing you know, there's not much there left. So we turn now to Matthew chapter 6 and what Jesus had to say. Now, of course, this is the Sermon on the Mount. It's about halfway through, midway through the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus has said all sorts of things to us and still has many more things to say to us after this. But right here in the middle of it, he speaks about the treasure that we seek. And what he tells us here is very simple. He tells us something not to do, something to do, and then gives us a way of examining ourselves just very quickly. So first of all, note with me, if you will, in verse number 19. Jesus teaches us to forsake our idols. He doesn't use that language, but that is in a nutshell precisely what he's telling us to do. He's telling us or instructing us to forsake our idols. Now notice what he says, verse number 19. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. That is to say, don't go about your affairs, don't go about all the doing of your life seeking to build a kingdom for yourself here on this earth. Don't lay up for yourselves treasures on this earth. Now, what is he getting at here? What does it mean to lay up treasures? Well, to lay up simply means that you're seeking after or you're driven for or you're consumed by the advancement of one of these things. But what kinds of things? Well, in all likelihood, this does have a financial reference. The treasures that he references here probably does have something to do with the accumulation of wealth, something that we are very prone to do. We go about life, we try to collect and collect and collect, and we build a kingdom for ourselves. But it can't just be financial well-being that Jesus has in mind. Go back to the beginning of chapter 6 for just a second. In chapter 6, verse number 1 through verse number 4, Jesus talks about doing good deeds. And essentially what he says to us is, as you do good deeds, don't do them so that you will be noticed. He goes into verse number five and he prepares us for prayer. And what does he teach us to do in verse number five through verse number nine or verse number eight? He basically tells us that when we do pray, don't do it so that others see us. Don't use the vain repetition. Don't pray on the street corners. Verse number 16, fasting. Verse number 16 through 18. He talks about fasting here and says, when you do fast, don't do it so that other people will see you. What is Jesus saying for verse number 1 through 18 in chapter 6? He's essentially saying, don't go about your spiritual business for the sake of personal recognition. So the backdrop of this statement now, verse number 19 through 21, while it surely has some financial connotations to it, also when we situate it against the backdrop of verse number one through 18, seem to be suggesting something bigger than that. It's not just the seeking of money and lucre, it's also the seeking of fame or power or any of those other types of things. You say, well, that's not what we're after, right? Well, again, I will grant that that is for many of us not how it begins, is it? For most of us, here's how it begins. Christ redeems us and restores us and he overwhelms us with his grace and we fall deeply and madly in love with Christ. And because of that, we now want to advance his kingdom, to preach his gospel and to see people redeemed. That is often how it begins. But in this little ecosystem, of Christian ministry, where men and women give everything they have and sacrifice their lives and come into this, there are other types of enticements that will eventually come. We get into the the doing of Christian ministry, and the next thing you know, our friend is recognized. Our friend is elevated. And the next thing you know, we are consumed with questions like this. Why is it that people don't recognize me for what I'm doing? Why is it that people only recognize this person or that person? And then we buy into this idea. We give ourselves to the pursuit of personal fame, power, money, prestige, and we are now building a kingdom for ourselves. Jesus says to us, don't do it. 
Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on this earth, whether that's financial treasure, whether that's power, whether that's fame or any of those things. Listen, we have to be a people that remember that our fortune is not here. Our well-being is not here, but rather it is in heaven, as we will see in verse number 20. But there's a question here. Why? Why is it that I'm not <clears throat> to seek my own? I mean, this goes against everything this world s- screams at us, doesn't it? In our world, whether it's in politics or sports or just in, in pop culture itself, everybody is after getting theirs. And while we will say to ourselves, that's not me, that's not us, often subtly, implicitly within the core of our being, we do give ourselves to those things. But why is it bad to seek your own? Well, I would, I would point to a couple things here. First of all, it's idolatry. To do anything other than love Christ and give yourself to his kingdom is idolatrous. It is just not what you're made for. God made you. That's where you come from. And if you come from him, then you're made for him. Your whole life is to be offered back to him as an offering. So to pursue your own kingdom, to to lay up for yourselves treasure in this world is to live a life of idolatry. You say, well, that's not what he says there in verse number 19. Well, no, but look at verse number 24. Verse number 24, he says this, No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. No man can serve God and mammon. In other words, if you give your life to the laying up of treasures for yourself, you're worshiping that, and it is idolatrous. You now hate God by implication of what you do. So it's wrong because it's idolatrous. It's wrong also because it's futile. This is what Jesus says at the end of verse number 19. Notice what he says there. Don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. Why? Well, he says it. That's where moth and rust destroy and thieves break in to steal. In other words, you could go about all of those things and lose it all. I remember about 15 years ago, both my father and my wife's fathers were multimillionaires. By the, t- by the end of 2009, after the economy tanked, both of them were broke. You could accumulate much for yourself and lose it all. You could accumulate fame for yourself, but listen to me, I promise you, you will lose that. It takes one bad tweet and you lose it all. It takes one tainting of your reputation and you lose it all. But even this, even if you finish well and even if you are esteemed by the masses significantly when you die, here is a promise. This world will forget you. This world will forget you. I don't care how well known you are, how much you accomplish. Listen, there comes a day when this world forgets the name Jamie Dew. There comes a day day when the world forgets a New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary. There comes a day when all of us are forgotten. You say, man, that's bleak and surely not true. Oh, it is certainly true. Let me ask you this question. What was the name of your, this is family now, of your great, 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 great grandfather? You don't know it. Why? Because you forgot it. Because this world will forget you. What is the name of the 22nd president of the United States? There might be somebody in here that has them memorized chronologically, and they could rattle them off and get to 22, but off the top of your head, you don't know it. And this was a person that, when elected, was the most popular person in this country. This world will forget you. So why... Seek fame. Listen, it's not just idolatrous. It's futile to live your life that way. Let me give you one other reason. I think this is the most important one of all. It's not life-giving. You want to build up for yourselves, lay down for yourselves treasures in this earth. You want to accumulate much for yourself, whether that's wealth or power or fame or any of those other things. Listen, it's not life-giving It will not ultimately satisfy. Why? Because you're made for something higher and better than that, namely Christ. You're made for him and therefore he and only he can satisfy the soul. Isaiah says it this way, Isaiah 55 verse 1 through 3. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me. Eat what is good. Let your, delight, let your soul delight itself in abundance. Incline your ear and come to me here and your soul shall live. That question, 
Why do you spend money for what does not satisfy? Why do you buy bread that does not satisfy? Is an important question for us. It's futile and it isn't life-giving to build up treasures for ourselves, number one. Number two, Jesus teaches us not only to reject our idols, Jesus also teaches us to invest in his kingdom. This is the flip side of the coin. If he's telling us not to do this, then this is now what he is telling us to do. Verse number 20. Instead of laying up for yourselves treasures on this earth, we are to lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven, where he says, neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves don't break up and steal. Now, here's an important question. How do you do that? How do you lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven versus treasures on this earth? Is it by make sure that you preach the word? Is it make sure that you study the scriptures? Is it make sure that you pray your prayers? Is it make sure that you have your quiet times and your devotions? Is it make sure that you give your, your tithes and your offerings to the church? How do we do this? How is it that we lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven, not on earth. Well, I wish I could point to any one of those things. And I assume that as a believer, someone that's devoted to Christ, we would indeed do all of those things. But I don't think that we can actually point to any one of those things as the answer to that question. How is it that we lay up treasures in heaven, not on earth? Well, we can't point to those things. Here's why. What Jesus seems to be speaking of here is not necessarily a formula on how we execute tasks. What Jesus is pointing to here is an orientation of heart and of mind. In other words, what Jesus is after here is what my heart is seeking after, what my mind thinks after, what my soul will give itself to fully and completely. Jesus is not giving us a formula here. He's telling us how to orient our lives. We are to be a people that think about and seek the kingdom of God above everything else. He said it this way, Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, just a handful of verses later. In the context of worry, teaching us not to worry, he said this at the end of the passage, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things shall be added to you. In other words, the thing I'm to be after more than anything at all is His kingdom and His righteousness. And that when I do that, ultimately there is blessing. You know, when I think about this, I think about Moses. Moses, as he forsook the pleasures of Egypt and gave himself to a kingdom that was still yet to come, a kingdom that he could not yet see, a kingdom that he could not yet touch. And yet the book of Hebrews says this to us, says this, that Moses, by faith, when he was born, he was hidden for three months by his parents, because they saw that he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's command. By faith, when he became, uh, by faith, Moses, when he became of age, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Pause right there for just a second. What would it be like to be the son of Pharaoh's daughter? It would be like this. You'd have anything that you'd want. You've had, you'd have luxury. You'd have a posh life. You'd have every accommodation you'd have fame, you'd have power, you'd have it all. You'd have everything that people in this world would want. But by faith, when he became of age, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Listen to this statement. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. And he esteemed the reproach of Christ of greater riches than the treasures in all of Egypt. Why? Because he looked towards a reward. Can you imagine that? Moses would forsake everything, all the luxury and all the accommodation and all the power and all the fame, and he would go eat dust with the Hebrews. Why would you do something like that? Because he understood that this was not his reward. That the passing pleasures of Egypt were precisely that, the passing pleasures of this world, and that he was not made for that, that there's something better, there's something bigger, and he gave his life to that completely. And he counted the sufferings of Christ of greater value, as Paul did in Philippians chapter 3. He counted the sufferings of Christ of greater value than all of those passing pleasures of Egypt. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Listen, he's subtle. 
the enemy. The enemy doesn't jump out and say, hey, look at me, I'm really evil, follow me. He attacks you when you're tired, when you're fatigued, when you feel like you cannot give anything more, physically or emotionally, and there in those moments you cut corners and you take bait. He comes to you in the form of fame and power, especially he'll entice you this way. He'll let someone else get the credit. He'll get, let someone else get the esteem. He'll let someone else be thought highly of and not you. And create in you a disposition of longing and desiring and therefore seeking. And the next thing you know, we've given ourselves over to it. What Jesus says to us here is don't do that. Don't do that. Don't lay up for yourselves treasures on this earth. Lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven. Notice the, the nature of this command here. Notice the, the, the care, the pastoral care for His people in that command. Jesus is not bonking us over the head here, making us feel shamed that we're not honoring Him and glorifying Him. No, He's thinking about you and He's thinking about me. He's saying, you lay up for yourself treasures in heaven, not on earth. You invest yourself in that which matters and lasts for all of eternity, not in those other things. Jesus tells us, teaches us here to reject our idols. Jesus instructs us also to invest in His kingdom. Thirdly and finally, verse 21, Jesus teaches us to examine our own hearts to see where we are. Because here's the temptation that we're all going to have at this point. We're all going to sit here and listen to what Jesus has to say, myself included, and we're going to say something like this. Yeah, I'm good. I don't do that. Well, verse 21. Verse 21. For where your treasure is. What does that mean? Stop right there. What does that mean? Where your treasure is. The thing that you value the most. The thing that occupies your thought constantly. The thing that you seek after with your energy and your efforts. The thing that you spend your money, your time, and your attention to. Whatever that thing is, ultimately what Jesus wants you to see is that's your devotion. Where your treasure is, that thing that you're after, that thing that you value and esteem above everything else. Listen to what he says now. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. In other words, that's what you're actually worshiping right there. What is it that you seek? You know, the ancient monks would ask that question to new monks coming into the monastery. They would meet them there at the front door as the new monk would come in. And before they even entered into the monastery, they'd hit them with the question, quid pettis? What is it that you seek? Sounds like a silly question to ask a guy entering a monastery. While I seek to be a monk, of course. Why would you take up that life? Why would you give yourself to this type of thing? What is it that's driving you? They'd ask that question, not expecting a quick and easy answer right there on the spot. No, they would ask the question in such a way that the question would burn in their mind and bounce around and bother them for a season. What is it that you seek? Because even in the doing of God's work, the enemy can entice you to build your own kingdom, whether that be a kingdom of money, a kingdom of power, a kingdom of fame. It's all there and available to us as we pursue this work. What is it that you seek? Jesus tells us here where your treasure is, the thing that you treasure and value and esteem the most, that is where your heart is. That is what you worship. So as we close, let me ask you a couple of questions. What is it that you seek? In the doing of all of this stuff, what is it that you seek? What is it that you love the most? That you seek the most? What is your time, your attention, your money, your effort, your conversation always about? What is it that you seek? And understand this. The enemy is designing all of this the things that happen in our life and the things that He entices us with to destroy us and to ruin us. But Christ is at work in us and through us to give us life and to have it more abundantly. Father, we do pray that You would bless us as we close here this day. Thank You for Midwestern and Spurgeon College and 
all that you're doing in the life of this faculty, this administration through Dr. Allen, and these students. And Father, we rejoice in how you will use these men and women for decades to come. Father, help us to be a people that don't get enticed, that don't get lured into the enticements of this world, to the pleasures of this world, and seek to build our own kingdoms and to lay up for ourselves our own treasures. Help us, Father, to seek you, your righteousness and your kingdom, and that above everything else. And use us, we pray, for your kingdom. We love you, we bless you, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.